everyone. Welcome to the Copy Blogger Podcast. My name is Tim Stoddart. Thank you so much for joining me. My guest today is my good friend, Daryl Vesterfeld. Daryl, welcome. Glad you're here. Thanks for having me, man. Of course. I'm going to tee this one up with a quick but funny story. One of the last times I hung out with you when we lived in Nashville, we went to that coffee shop that was near your office. Um, not the one in East Nashville, the one that was like on the street of, of your, I forget what it was called. And I remember sitting down with you and you said, Hey man, I got this idea. I'm going to sell off some equity and like some assets that I own. And I'm going to start a new company about like farming and homesteading and canning vegetables. And I remember just being like, well, I didn't see that one coming. Um, nonetheless, you have, I don't want to say found a lane because it's not like you invented this thing, right? But you definitely saw an opportunity that I don't think a lot of people saw. And uh, since then, you have started schooloftraditionalskills.com. Um, I think subsequently you created a magazine, Homestead Living. I think that's the right one. Did I get yeah, that right? Okay, cool. I was yeah. kind of nervous that I, I had the wrong website pulled up. Um, and it seems like everything is going well. So please tell me how on earth you came up with with this idea and how how this came into your life. Yeah, it's, it's kind of wild, man. Uh, I'm like the knuckle tattoo guy who drives uh, a nice car and I'm like now doing the homesteading stuff. Um, and it's, it's a story that if you kind of look at it from the outside looking in, doesn't make a lot of sense. But if you zoom out even further, it makes a lot of sense in a couple of ways. First, I grew up in a really, really rural part of Michigan. My grandpa's a farmer. We had gardens and we preserved food and we foraged and hunted growing up. Um, so it's a very normal part of my life. One that I, when I was 18 years old, I was like, deuces, I'm out of here. Like, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to go to the city. So it was a part of my life that I kind of had abandoned. Um, and I lived in Minneapolis. I lived in Portland, Oregon. I lived in Nashville. I lived in New York city. And I really was like, like forgetting about a part of my life that many people didn't know because, uh, they just knew me in the context of, you know, the guy who worked at ConvertKit, the guy who was an entrepreneur and the guy who was like living in Brooklyn or Nashville or whatever else. And so it was a context that was surprising for people who knew me kind of in a shorter lens. But if you zoom out a little bit more, it made a lot of sense. And then from the business perspective, I have had an agency for many years called Good People Digital. Um, good people exist to serve creators in the development of e-learning and community. So courses and communities, it's something that I've done for a long, long time. I had several clients that were coming to me from the homesteading world uh, because of relationships that I had made in that space, um, where I saw the market in that, that space start to grow, especially through COVID. Um, and think about in COVID, um, everything was shut down. Like I remember ordering groceries early on and like things were running out of the grocery store. Like things were uncertain. So things like food preservation and gardening really blew up during COVID because there's a lot of like uncertainty. So I saw some of my clients, their businesses just explode through COVID. And some of the things that I was seeing, like guys that I played football with in high school were making sourdough bread and like posting pictures of it on social media. And I was like, there's something here. Like there's a bigger trend here. And so we kind of watched, I, I just watched that it was a huge peak, but then when it came back down from that peak, there was like a new floor of what this content was looking like. And I started to see a trend of this market growing. So it was like, Hey, this stuff is like kind of calling me back home a little bit to like the life that I had growing up. And at the same time, from a business perspective, I saw an opportunity. And so the marriage of those two things was super awesome where I could use the 15 years of experience in developing e-learning and websites and growing traffic and marketing and growth with this thing that made sense. Like I know how to garden. I know how to like, uh, like do all the things in the homesteading space. Um, and I just, I'd kind of taken a hiatus from it. So it was really a, a cool combination between like calling back to my personal life, but also using all the skills in my business. And when I saw the opportunity, um, one thing that my friend Nathan Barry has said to me several times is like, he's like, you kind of are a strip mall guy. You kind of got like four or five small projects. Like why don't you build a skyscraper and go all in on something? And so I really 
exactly for that reason, I sold off some assets and some things I was working on to focus so I could try to build something in a vertical that would go go up and uh, I could stop being, uh, Nathan, this is for you, I could stop being a strip mall guy and I start being a skyscraper guy. <laughs> so. That sounds about right. Um, there's a lot of places that we can go here, but one of the reasons why I'm excited to talk to you is because you are much more of an operator kind of guy. You're you're not out there necessarily promoting yourself 24 um, seven. Not that if you would, I would think that that's bad by any means. It's just not not really your style. At least I don't perceive it to be your style. But with that being said, people that are listening to this for the first time and may not necessarily know so, some of your past work, I, I want to give some context because you mentioned. The reason why I'm saying this is because you mentioned that like a lot of things came together all at the same time. And so you had experience in a bunch of different places, which all of a sudden it was like it met at this this uh, this perfect intersection. And so I'll start listing some things off um, and then please correct me where where I might have got this wrong. You've had your agency for a long time. You mentioned good people digital. Um you you thrive in the agency space really just because of, i think the logistics and the operations that are there i believe you had a company called authority authoritative, authoritative yeah. maybe yeah. yeah um and that was almost like a consulting firm to help people create their own courses where you did the production the editing yeah. i think you even went to people's houses or went to people's offices and like sat down with them so that they could record the material yeah, you have a ton of experience selling via webinars uh, mm -hmm. with with ConvertKit, and then you, it seemed like you went back to your agency a, a little harder until all of these these lanes intersected, which which brings you into this space now. So we don't yeah. necessarily need to harp on this. I'm not trying to make it one of those like, well, how did you get your start stories, you know? But I do think it's important for people to know the the different lanes that that you played in so yeah just give us give us a little background i started blogging in 2004 so it's coming up on like 20 years in this space yeah like i started blogging long 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 time ago and uh so the context has switched some uh and more it's like the nomenclature of it has changed so much like nobody calls ourselves bloggers anymore um but early on it was like i started writing a blog when i was in college and i i got the idea of how powerful it was that content could be seen all over the world. And for an 18 year old kid sitting in their dorm room, I'm like, dude, somebody's reading this in Romania and South Africa. Like, how is that possible? I became addicted to it right away. So I've been, I've been blogging since 2004, lots of time in the middle there. The biggest challenge in that space was like, how do I make a living doing this? And there was a lot of conversation in the early days of like, can I just get to six figures? Can I like make a business around six figures? So that intersected into the publishing world quite a bit because online courses weren't a thing until like 2010, like 9, 10, 11 is when that started popping up a little bit with guys like Michael Hyatt and my friend Jeff Goins, I know, started doing it. But online courses weren't a thing. So before that, it was like, can I get a publishing deal? Like, can a, can a publisher pay me for a book contract and then I can make some money on it? Or can I sell some eBooks or can I sell uh, advertising on my blog? It was like, let's scrape together anything we can to make six figures. And I remember um, one of the books that really like hit me early on was an ebook from Chris Gillibo called 279 days to overnight success. And it was like literally like his playbook of how to make six figures from his blog. I was like, that's cool. Like if we can make six figures. And so I've dabbled in the publishing world. I was actually a literary agent for a few of my friends, um, helping them get book deals because I Googled one day, how to become a literary agent because I was assuming there had to be like a real estate agent, like a certification or a class I had to take and there was nothing. So I just started calling myself a literary agent. It doesn't agent. surprise me at all, by the way, <laughs> to hear that you were randomly a literary agent for some of your friends. I still <laughs> get like, I still surprising. get royalty checks for some of the books. It's kind of crazy. That's the... um, uh, it's not a lot because those books are not selling a lot, but I learned the industry of publishing a little bit, right? So I'm not an yeah. expert. I'm not the best literary agent, but I had a little bit of experience there. So like that's a skill that got put on the shelf a bit, a lot in social media. Like how do we get traffic to websites? So I dabbled in SEO. I'm not as good at you, but like I, I had a little bit. So that's a little skill that I can put on the shelf. Um, I was really good at connecting. So I ran a thing called the bloggers meetup for a lot of years um, where we would go to conferences and we'd have a hundred or 200 bloggers come together 
And so that kind of network is what got the eye of Nathan at ConvertKit. And he's like, hey, come be biz dev director for us because you've got all these connections in the blogging world. Like, come connect those people to ConvertKit because like we have a solution to a problem I know they have. And I was like, great. So I literally took like idea of like getting people together at conferences and those relationships that I built into a biz dev director role. And I succeeded there. Cool. I learned a lot about biz dev. Okay, put that on the shelf as a skill. Um, and then I started like creating these online courses when I worked at, at um, I worked for a, a best-selling author and we developed an online course and uh, that, that was just a part of my nine to five job where I was making $50,000 a year. We helped develop an online course and it succeeded. And I was like, oh, that's a skill. Put that on the shelf. And so I started to build like this repertoire of skills that I could take to future projects. So the first step was, hey, I can do this as a service to other people, right? I've got these skills. I'll do that as a service. So we built the agency. Uh, the agency is, you know, a, a couple million dollars a year, a team of 15. Um, it's a great little business, but there's limitations of what's possible at that point. So then how do I build assets beyond just the agency with all these skills? Great. Let's take the like content and blogging skills. Let's take some of the SEO skills. Let's take some of the biz dev skills and marketing strategy skills I had here. Let's take some of the webinar skills, all these skills, like put it together. And that's where school of traditional skills has really been an area where I can take a lot of those skills off the shelf that I've developed over 17, 18 years. And now I've got a thing that I can build, like I can build that vertical skyscraper. To be around, so. Hey there, it's Tim, and I need to take a moment to tell you about this show's sponsor. It's a product called Hype Fury. When I was able to speak to Yannick, uh, who is the CMO, one of the founding partners of Hype Fury, and he agreed to sponsor the show, I was so thrilled. And the reason is because I have personally used Hype Fury for the last three years, and it has allowed me to build my social media following and my personal brand to over 70,000 followers. I could not have done it without Hype Fury. And I, I really, really mean that. I use this product every day and it's added so much to my business and to my life. So Hype Fury is a social media scheduling tool. It has three main features that I think separates it from every other tool. One, it, it allows you to quickly create content and schedule them. So it's a very nuanced feature, but it's so helpful. Basically, I, I sit down at my desk in the morning and I type out my tweet, and I type out my LinkedIn post, and then all I do is I hit enter. And Hype Fury schedules it at the opportune time on Twitter and on LinkedIn. I don't have to think about it any more than that. All I have to do is sit down and create my tweets, create my posts, hit enter, and Hype Fury does all the work for me. Uh, second, Hype Fury makes it so that you can easily create threads. And threads have been the biggest value add for me in growing my following. So threads really helped me grow my following on Twitter and those threads format themselves into longer form LinkedIn posts on LinkedIn. It's actually kind of funny. I made a video about this not too long ago about how, yes, like you want to create threads on Twitter. You want to be a thread boy because I'd say like 80% of my growth on both Twitter and LinkedIn have been from threads and long form posts. And I wouldn't have been able to format any of this without using Hype Fury. Uh, and then third, Hype Fury is really good for keeping you inspired. So what it does is it, it shows you some of your most popular tweets and your most popular posts. And it, it basically gives you information. It gives you inspiration as to what your audience is looking for and what they most actively engage in. So you're never sitting at the computer thinking, oh man, like, what am I going to say today? What, you know, what kind of content am I going to create today? It's constantly feeding you new ideas, new inspiration, and it allows you to, to quickly create this content so that you can continuously get yourself out there, continuously build your brand, and most importantly, turn that social media following into newsletter subscribers. So through Hype Fury, I've been able to grow my personal email list, timstads.com, to over 30,000 followers. That's turned into a business within itself. It's really helped me grow the Copy Blogger newsletter. We're at 110,000 followers right now. A whole lot of that is, is also because of Hype Fury. So please, this is a product that I use every single day. I personally vouch for it. You can check it out at hypefury.com. H-Y-P-E-F-U-R-Y. 
www.thisisbusiness.com. If you have any problems with it, you can send me a DM on Twitter and I'm sure I can convince you as to why it will add value to your life. So hypefury.com. Thank you so much to Hype Fury for sponsoring the show. And let's get back to the episode. Amazing. I love I love the journey there because I think you and I have always agreed that, how do I say this? I don't ever want to say that you don't want to have a plan because I think having a plan is actually really, really important, but I've never in my life once had a plan ever even come close to working. It was always like, just do the next thing. New opportunities emerge. Next do right thing, man. thing. Next right yeah. thing. That's it. That's it. The next right thing. So... I love hearing that journey. I think that's a really great nugget to pull from it. But um, okay, great. So we have some context. We know about your business. Now, please, what the hell is homesteading? And <laughs> what, <laughs> what, yeah. what is homesteading? Yeah, there's a, there's a wide range of what this means for a lot of different people. But homesteading really is about building self-sufficiency or community sufficiency around your life. So how this manifests is gardening, how this manifest is raising animals, chickens for eggs or chickens for meat or having a milk goat or a milk cow um, and, and just building sufficiency outside of the reliance of the system or the man uh, in some ways. And so, um, for example, like I think there's a spectrum of this, too. Like I have friends who I would consider homesteaders uh, who live in a suburban area. Like I had a, I had breakfast with a friend today and she lives in a suburban part of Minneapolis. She has chickens. She has a sourdough starter. She has a garden in her backyard and she goes to the farmer's market. And so she's kind of building a sufficiency around the community of the people around her and around her own, her own area, but she's not reliant on like the big systems of, of everything else. So, and then my business partner, Josh, he lives on 40 acres and they grow probably 90 to 95% of their food or raise their food on their property. So it goes from like larger, kind of like, I would consider it close to farm systems, all the way down right. to like, you know, people living in Brooklyn in an apartment who have, you know, small gardens on their, their balcony or are connected to a community of other gardeners or farmers markets or things like that. So a wide range of what it means, at least to us or to me. Um, but really, it's around self and community sufficiency, specifically around food, uh, and kind of having reliance on on what you have and where you're at, things like that. Self reliance. Yeah. Okay, so all of these skills come together. Yeah. You find an opportunity, or at least you see an emerging opportunity. You are at a place in your life where you're you're ready to build a skyscraper. So let's talk about how this happens. Um, but when I look at, at a business model like this, I wouldn't even necessarily know where to start. And it's not that the model itself is uh, u unique, like it's it, it's not ununique, you know, but it's you're not breaking down any walls in terms of, of how you're marketing it. I think what's unique about it is you're you're tapping into a community that is within itself self-reliant just like you yeah. said you know like they don't need marketers to come in <coughs> and blow this thing up for them yeah and so how, how did you build a community of community members like how did you get the word out there how did you get people interested in this in the first place yeah what did that look like let me give a little context so school of traditional skills is a membership a subscription to a library of courses very similar to master class um, we have 21 classes now. We release a new class about every single month. So wow. the, the, the value of the subscription increases every month because we're just releasing new content. So that a little bit of context on that. And, and what I'll say, Tim, is I'm not that smart. So like I have realized that like I just want to go see what other people are doing and I want to see if I can do it too. So I saw Masterclass. Masterclass is a multi-billion dollar valuation. They've raised hundreds of millions of dollars. It's doing it at a large scale, right? That's a huge company. And I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm just smart enough to know that I probably can't create that and I don't necessarily want to, but like that model has been proven to work, right? It's working yeah. and it's working. So cool. I don't have to pretend like it works because it's already validated that it's working. Somebody else is doing it. Awesome. There's a, a thing there. And something I learned at ConvertKit when I joined up with Nathan early on is um, the idea of carving out your 
niche in your area. So at the time, MailChimp was the, the behemoth in the space, right? Yeah. Millions and millions and millions of customers, hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue, billions in valuation. And then ConvertKit, we are this scrappy young company. And I saw what Nathan's vision was for the company. And we were carving out a small part of that market, right? We didn't ever, like the vision that Nathan was, was setting for us was never to create the next MailChimp. That wasn't it. But what we were going to do is we were going to serve a segment of the market better than MailChimp could serve, right? So we were email marketing for bloggers and we did automation for bloggers in an easier way to understand than Infusionsoft did. So we're like taking the parts of like serving a very specific niche, right? And Nathan has obviously built a ton of value in the marketplace and a ton of value for him and his family. Um, I don't remember the exact valuation, but it's in the couple hundred million dollars now with the, the secondary round that they're raising. So like, that's awesome. Like, but you know what? That's not MailChimp. What he's doing is serving a specific need for a specific customer. And he's carving out a part of the marketplace that he can do better than anybody else. So great. So my MailChimp is masterclass. Mm-hmm. I now have a specific segment of the audience or of the market that I know that we can serve better. And I know that we can serve them better because of the, um, the partners that I have in this space, right? Like they are actually living the lifestyle. They're doing it. They're experts in their field. So um, Masterclass has classes on gardening. They have classes on traditional cooking. They have classes on co- some of this stuff. But the reason that we can do it is that we don't have a class on leadership from Hillary Clinton or on free throws from Steph Curry or like other random stuff. So they're going at a mass market we're going at a very niche market. And so we're going to serve that niche market better than anybody else possibly can using the same model. So like they're kind of a competitor, but not really. We're not really a competitor to them because the people who sign up for us would never sign up for them. But we're carving out a, like a very small part of the pie that like we can do better than anybody else. So I don't think we're ever going to get to billions of dollars of valuation, but I think we can get to hundreds of millions, Right. And so it's, it's looking at the bigger thing, seeing who we can serve better and carving out that small part of what we're doing. And so that's what School of Traditional Skills is, is like, hey, there's a market here, obviously. And I think we can serve this group of people better than anybody else. And so we're going to do that. And we're going to let no rock be unturned to figure out how we can serve that market, again, better than anybody else. Yeah. Oh, they're all over the place. It's really crazy. Like it is, it's a, and that's kind of where I found what I found is, you know, I saw the YouTube subscribers where they were like hundreds of thousands of YouTube subscribers. I was seeing the email list that were growing. There just really was kind of like a market for it already. Um, But nobody was doing what we wanted to do specifically. And so we knew, I knew that there was like a validation because I would see like, you know, my partners, they had hundreds of thousands of subscribers on YouTube. It's like, oh, that's a lot of attention. You know, Uh, I would see the email lists grow or the social platforms grow. And so there was attention there already. And honestly, you know, I'm not that smart, man. So it was like, hey, here's a good idea. Here's a validated model. And then I see the attention already there. All we got to do is connect the dots together. Right. And that's, yeah. that's really what we're doing is it's not rocket science. I think uh, I was with a friend last week and uh, we went to an AI conference and it was like, everybody was touting like all these magic pills that are going to save you uh, and grow these crazy businesses because AI is going to be this new, it's like, there's no secrets, man. Like it really is like, Hey, we saw a market. We saw a model that was validated. We saw attention there. Like just connect the dots. Like it's not, there's not a lot of rocket science to it. So uh, I know that's a really boring answer, but it's the truth is like, that's what business is built on is like solve a problem better than anybody else. Do it in a compelling way and like find attention. And that's kind of it. So I have a, a, a similar example where I feel silly sometimes, not on copy blogger on my personal blog, because I just like to write. I remember you and I had a conversation once about reading rich dad, poor dad, and the idea of cash flow and using cash flow to buy assets, which generates more cash flow, which generates more assets, you know, and I know this is a little bit off topic, but 
I've had a, as my, my blog, like my personal email list is, has gotten bigger and bigger. I'm getting these kind of esoteric emails sent to me and it's getting to the point where I'm like, Hey, look, I feel like I'm just saying the same thing over and over again. And basically like, this is how you do it. And no matter which example you come into and like which angle you look at it, yeah, this is the thing to do. And I don't have to be smart to do it. I just have to follow a process over and over and over again. And so it sounds like you just found a process that you know that works. And whether it's in homesteading, which is good because you're passionate about it, or I don't know, like I know you're passionate about basketball or, or whatever it is. Yeah. You're not creating anything new. You're just sticking to a process. I have a I have a theory about this, Tim. Um, because I cool. think businesses that don't think through some of these steps, they're lucky and they don't yeah. admit that they're lucky. Um, and then businesses that succeed that are strategic are thinking through these things. Um, there's a book that I love called Extreme Revenue Growth. And it's really a book about product market fit. <laughs> it's like, who's your avatar? What problem are you solving for them? How are you doing it differently than others? Are people willing to pay for that solution? It's like the basics. And I'm like, wait, this is a book about revenue growth. And the more and more I think about it, it's like the companies that are growing revenue find product market fit. Sometimes you do that by luck because you're solving a problem that you have. And so you just are doing it intuitively. Sometimes you do it strategically like I did, where it's like, I see a market, I see a need, I see how we can do it better or different. Great. I kind of hit product market fit. Other people just like, hey, uh, I had this problem. So I created a widget or a service to solve that problem for myself. They were doing the product market fit thing just for themselves. And then they knew that there were other people like them, right? And so I think like business is not hard. It's really not. And people who are selling you that it's hard are probably selling you something on it. But like the process is really simple. Solve a problem, do it in a more compelling or credible way, figure out how much people are willing to pay for it and then sell it to them. And you just got to do that over and over again. And you just do it better than the people around you. So again, I'm not that smart. I'm like a poor kid from a trailer house and I like didn't get good grades in school. And if I can figure it out, it's like, it's just the same process over and over again. And again, no matter what market you're in, that's what you got to do. And so, uh, yeah, the people who win are the people who just do it and don't quit and uh, who do it better than the people around them. So let's talk about the attention that yeah. you say that you recognized. I'm, I'm really curious right now about where traffic comes from, because you're like me in yeah. that your business is built around a website. Yeah. And an email list. And uh, I, I've been hearing that the sky is falling forever about how any social media site or Google or AI or podcasts, like it's all going to be traffic that is owned by that property and people aren't going to want to send traffic to websites anymore. And I, I keep waiting for this thing to happen because all I ever see is my Google numbers keep going up, my YouTube numbers keep going up. Um, and so, with with that bit of context, I'm just I'm really interested right now about let's call it the state of traffic, right? Yeah. Out of the attention mechanisms that you say that you recognized in your space in particular, which which one is providing the most value for you? Is it still old school long form content? Is it is it videos? What's working? Yeah. Um, so again, when you're early on, you can only do so much. The thing that yeah. I'm good at more than anything else is like partnerships. So out of the gate, this is how we launched the company, which I think is a pretty interesting story, is we knew that we had friends who had attention, right? Mainly on email lists. Um, we also knew that Facebook advertising was working in our particular niche in ways that it wasn't working in others because there wasn't as much competition. Hey. So the thing that we decided to do was a big webinar event, um, like a summit, an online summit. Uh, we call it the traditional skills summit. And we just like, we were willing to do it better and to like risk more and to make more ask than anybody else. So we had a pretty significant advertising budget because we knew, we knew because we had done it before that we could get leads for a specific lead cost there. And we were okay with doing that. So we advertised, you know, a, a good, a good chunk there. We also knew that we had lots of friends who would be willing to share for an affiliate commission uh, and so we had a hundred thousand people register for our summit right out of the gate. Oh. So like immediately we knew we had attention because we could leverage 
our skill with Facebook advertising. Again, we, we didn't figure it out on Reddit or Pinterest or YouTube or anywhere else, but we knew that we could do it on Facebook. And we knew that we had friends that would also share about it. And so we aligned incentives there too. And we were able to do the launch and the launch went really well. We did a five and a half percent conversion rate. So right out of the gate, we had 5,500 paying members in our first week. And so it was like gathering that attention in that way. And then we knew we would have the ability to market and remarket to the email list of those who didn't convert. So right out of the gate, we just knew that we had that um, because we were trying to kind of get to a critical mass as fast as possible from that point. Then we could have the budget to start investing in SEO and long form content and video and other things in the future. And we're just to the point now we're getting to be able to do some of that. But that's kind of like that stuff is some of the long tail stuff that takes months and months and months to see returns on um, where we wanted to kind of get a return right out of the gate so that we could hire a team and keep momentum moving fast. And so we've done that. We also do those kind of events on a smaller scale every single month where we'll get between, you know, 10 and 15,000 people to register, which again is infusing a new group of people into our, our system. Uh, we can then do what we know with email marketing um, on that point. And uh, that gives us time, buys us time to start doing some of the, like the longer tail stuff. Um, so we can start layering different marketing approaches. Um, but that's what we've done. Webinars, live events. That's been my Truth. background. It's how we grew ConvertKit early on too. I think I taught 150 webinars in 12 months at ConvertKit. It's just like what I knew to do. And again, I'm not that smart, so I can only do like one or two things at a time. So we just kind of do that until we got a system around and then we can start layering other other strategies. What you just talked about is one of the reasons why AI doesn't scare me because I, I almost think this emergence of AI is going to reinforce that person-to-person deal-making. There's an example that I think about all the time. I mean, you met my wife. She's super into fitness. She's like, everybody loves her. She's just one of those people, you know, where like everybody just loves her. And um, we live in a neighborhood in Denver called Sloan's Lake. There's a big giant lake across the street from me. And it's it's really beautiful. And there's like a big, big patch of grass, basically a big field. And uh, she was discovering a community of recent mothers that wanted to exercise but didn't know how and you go online and everybody just says go for walks basically but i mean my wife is a a strength trainer basically and and the analogy that she made was always how is it that right before women are having babies they're told to rest and not strengthen their bodies when they're just about to do the most physically demanding thing that is possible for a person to do and so she put this connection together that there's a lot of women out there that just had babies that think like, yeah, I want to get my my body strong again. And everybody's telling me just to sit in bed and like eat soup all day. Point is, she made a little workout group where every Sunday, a couple moms get together at the lake across the field and they do strength training and like specific strength training for, for your core and, and shrinking those muscles back up. Within two and a half months, there were 30 to 40 people come in and she didn't even try. It was basically just putting people together, just bringing people together that all have uh, maybe communities. That, yeah, I mean, let's say a community, just a community of new mothers that have this this shared but it, experience But together. it's also like a specific problem for a specific yep. group of people in a specific niche. And that niche is Sloan Lake, yeah. right? So it's yeah. like, how is AI going to compete against that? Like AI could create 50 hundred articles, 50 million articles about strengthening your core. But like, how is it going to compete against a woman who's given birth twice, who lives in Sloan Lake, who can actually meet with people face to face? It's impossible. AI will never yeah. beat that. It will never, ever in a million years beat that. And so like, yeah, AI is a great tool to like, like improve or speed things up or like uh, become more efficient. But like, it can never replace that. Like, again, like for her, she knew the problem intimately because she went through it. So yeah. how is AI going to be able to empathize? You and I have talked about this many, many times. I think empathy is one of the strong, like the, the secret weapons for entrepreneurs. How is AI going to ever empathize with her, with like those women in that community, the way that your wife can? Because like, she's been there, she's done it, she's gone through it, she's cried the tears, she's like had the, the moments of insecurity, she's had like all of the emotional responses that she is going to feel in that moment, she's had them. AI can guess at that, but like, 
there's something different when you look somebody eye to eye and be like, I've been there. Totally. I'll help you solve that problem. Hey, I can never fix that. Totally. And people listening are probably sick of hearing me use this example before, but like I built online brands about sobriety, <laughs> right? Like you can, you can build online brands about anything as long as you meet those criteria that you just said, like you have specific knowledge and, and it's, it's almost specific, specific experiences, I think is a better way to say it because you yeah. can't have empathy without a shared experience, you, you know? Can. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that's beautiful. I think that's, and really, that's why you can build communities and sites around sobriety better than I ever could. Like, totally. cause you have a different, you have a different lived experience than I do in that space. Right. So the credibility that you have to solving that problem or speaking that message or copywriting or whatever else is way more credible than me. Like I could ask AI how to answer a question in that space. And I have like some experience in it, but not like you. Right. And so, I think that's the case and same with the homesteading space, right? Yeah. The reason that I think our, our company does so well is that my co-founder, one, he's like really, really smart and he's a really good business person. But two, like he grows all of his own food. They have huge gardens, they have cows and they have chickens and they have goats and sheep. And he has been doing this for 30 years. And it's like, there's credibility there. Um, I, I'll say this, there's a site in our space um, that is owned by a very well-known internet marketer, right? It makes money. It for sure makes money every single month, probably a lot on affiliate deals. The site gets traffic, but everybody in our niche knows that it's not authentic. Dang. Everybody. And you know what? I know he uses a lot of AI to develop content around it, but it's less valuable than what we do because it's authentic. It's like it's made by people who have lived experience. It's made by people who are experts in the space. So like they can sniff out the BS in like two seconds when they land on the site. And it's like, that does not right. Like homesteaders don't really talk like that. They don't really think like that. They don't really there's do those things in that order. So there's a level of authenticity where it's like my, my partner, his name is Josh. He cares so much about the content that goes out because it's like, it has to be authentic. It has to be like in our tone and voice. And so it's really, really important. Like AI can kind of mimic authenticity, but it just cannot have it in the same way. And so cool. Like that guy gets traffic to his homesteading site, but like ours is real and it, it feels and tastes and touches and, and like you can, you can sense it differently. And I think that authenticity and that empathy, it's just really different. Like AI will never know what it's like to have a pig escape a pen and spend three hours hey. trying to get it back in. Right just won't but josh does right and so the way yeah. that, that article gets written is different it's very going to be very clinical and dry again amazing tool to help maybe josh speed up writing that article but at the end of the day like the human connection and the empathy and the authenticity just cannot be recreated by any program ever yeah i, I could spend a couple of hours chit-chatting back and forth about this stuff with you but before we sign off i, I need to pivot to the homesteadliving.com. I think, I don't know the numbers behind your business. I'm assuming that homesteadliving.com is smaller than School of Traditional Skills. With that being said, I think this is the fucking coolest little business I have seen in such a long time. I love when people do like the what's old is new again type deal. I, it, I see it all the time. If, if I'm, I'm about to start a bell bottom company, you know, just Amazing. because this stuff is so cyclical and it keeps coming around and you're, you're making an actual magazine. Um, is it, you, is it print yet? Are you, you're printing them out yeah. now, right? Okay. Um, right. people listening, Daryl just, oh, dude, it looks great. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's it looks great. great. Yeah. It's like something you can touch and hold, which I think is so interesting. Same yeah. concept though, man. Again, I'm not that smart. People were just asking for it, so we developed it. And then once we started developing it, we saw that people really, really wanted it because they were voting with their dollars. And so we just started selling thousands and thousands of copy of the print edition. Homestead Living started as a digital subscription because, again, that's the yeah. world that I live in. So it solved a problem in a particular way, but it wasn't a very compelling way for our folks. The more compelling way is they wanted to touch it and to hold it and to, to feel it. So we're like, cool. Like people told us we went and solved that problem. And it's a, it's a seven figure business. Like it's a substantial business. It's not like a, a cute little business. Like I think that has legs 
So once I started going down that route, because people were asking for it, I started learning more. And what I learned is that half of all print publications went out during COVID for several different reasons. Like, oh, there's oh. an opportunity. Okay, that's kind of cool. Oh, people are actually responding and voting with their dollars saying they want print. And so we just started to double down into it more and more. Um, again, it's very new for us. We're learning a lot about the print market, but it's a different kind of business serving a similar niche. So I had already validated that this niche wanted content. I had already validated that they wanted print because they were telling me they did. And so we're just kind of learning more and more as we go. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a really great business that gets to serve in a different way. Right. So it's like same audience, same ideas in a lot of ways, but it's in a different way, a completely different way. So. Yeah. I want to hear about these specific lessons. I was a little surprised. I looked at it about two weeks ago uh, and I saw that you, you redesigned the the website because last time you showed it to me, you know, we text back and forth relatively often and the website didn't look like this and it was only a digital subscription. And so that's why I was a little hesitant where I was saying it's a print magazine now, right? Because last time we talked, it, it was just digital. So this is still pretty new. Like I said, I, th I think it's so cool. Uh, what's one of the random lessons? Whenever you start something like this, there's always a thing that you didn't know that you didn't know, right? Where where you go into it and you say, huh, like I, I did not see that coming. I, I did not realize that that was a part of this this space. What's one of those little idiosyncratic lessons that you've learned about having a print magazine? Again, I'm going to sound really dumb to everybody who's in e-commerce because this is not a new thing to have learned, but what I have learned is like advertising against a physical product is a completely different beast than advertising for digital products or webinars or things that people can't touch and hold. Um, I had another friend who's in the golf space and it's like, he had this business that was all digital for many, many years, all digital, all digital, all digital. It was stuck at a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. And then they developed four products that were all physical. And now the business is like four or $5 million two years later. And so wow. there's a different way. Again, the margins are completely different. So I have to learn a different, like different muscles in managing a business where there's actual like hard cost against the things that we make and there's shipping prices and uh, there's variable prices. Like sometimes printing costs this and shipping costs this and they change from time to time. So it's a different muscle. Um, again, people who are good at e-commerce are probably laughing at me a little bit because this is like, like table stakes for running a good business in the e-com space. But what I have learned is that people respond to physical products in a way they don't to digital. Um, and I lived in the digital space for 15 plus years, never doing anything physical and now getting the physical product space. Like I like it and I want to do more of it because it's just a whole different beast. Um, and it's a lot of fun. So um, yeah, we're able to acquire customers uh, at a, a much lower rate than we do on the digital stuff, um, which I was not anticipating. Um, so it, there's a lot to learn in that. Um, I'm kind of like growing up and maturing and kind of my business acumen of, you know, how you run cash flow for a business that there's physical products and then there's tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars of inventory sitting in a warehouse in Missouri um, and what it looks like to fund like large print runs and other things like that. It's a whole different game, but it's a lot of fun. Um, but again, like people respond differently to things they can touch and feel and hold. Um, it's a lot of fun. So, Before I sold my t-shirt company, the feeling of just boxes and boxes of shit that <laughs> you have to get rid of. And I also learned from an, a, a, an accounting standpoint, inventory isn't an expense because the way the government sees it is it's still like liquid. You know, it's so when, when you're spending money on inventory, that's not a business expense. That is still stuff that you have on to the balance sell. sheet, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just a different line item on the balance sheet. And there's a rush that comes with selling physical products that I, I learned a lot about. You know, for instance, I used to, it was a really small t shirt company. So I'm, I'm not trying to blow it up or nothing. I had the time to write handwritten notes on all of the poly bags and the emotion that I was able to share with the customers through that stuff, like the Instagram pictures that people took and they would send the pictures to me. You know, it was a much more personalized connection. Um, I, I do miss that. There's a couple of times where I've had opportunities to go back into e-com and I was like, no, you know, I, I'm not there right now. I don't know if I'll ever be there again. I really love what I'm doing. Nonetheless, there is just a different different vibe about it that that scratches like a different fun itch. It's really cool. Yeah. 
Yep. I like it. It's fun. It, it stretches my mind in different ways too, which is really, really great. I love, this is just a total aside to me. Business is, it's, it's like one of the greatest tools for personal growth and development. So oh, it's yeah. like when I like come up against a challenge, I'm like, awesome. I like, this is either going to expose all of my weaknesses or it's going to show me that I have skills that I didn't know either way. Like this is a great tool for growth. And so I love getting stretched and learned. That's like half the fun of business is the growth that you get to exhibit for yourself and, and kind of prove to yourself over and over again. Sure. All right. We have a closing question on this podcast. I like to know what it is that when you think of school of traditional skills and you sit alone and you're at your desk or you're just leaning back in your chair, you know, what is the vision that you have for this company in your head that is almost you're like apprehensive to share it with people, you know, when you see where this can go and that, that vision that comes in into your mind, describe that for us. I want to be the biggest platform in the world that educates people on self-sufficiency and homesteading. Um, and I think like, I, I don't feel ashamed of that vision at all. Like we've been, we've been like banging the drum on that vision since day one. Um, we actually raised venture capital money. So it was a part of like us raising the money of experience expressing this vision. I think there's a hundred thousand to 150,000 members in a space like that. Um, and honestly, this is one thing that I'm really passionate about right now. I think that vision and the size of that vision is why we're able to recruit such great talent into our team. And people yeah. are willing to take pay cuts. People are willing to like take what feels like quote step backwards because I think the vision and the bigger the vision and the more compelling the vision, it's like, it gets you excited in ways that it wouldn't otherwise when things get hard you can hang your hat on that vision a little bit and then your team is the same exact way our team is awesome we have a team of 14 people i'm like in the younger half of that team meaning that we have a ton of veterans or people who've been doing this for longer or as long as i have on several levels and people like really believe in the company because that vision is so big like we want to actually like make people's lives better we want to improve the way that they grow or think about their food we want to help them be more sustainable and have a different and better life. All of that at a large scale. And it's a really, really big vision. So I think like 150,000 people in the next five years. Um, and we want to be the biggest resource in the world, teaching people about homesteading and making their life more sufficient. It's one of the things about you that I've, that I've always admired and thought was difficult to come by is that you I don't know if it's in your genes or if you force yourself to do it, but you do things as big as you possibly can. <laughs> like sometimes I'm sure it seems like a gift. Some sometimes I'm sure it seems like a curse, but whatever that is about you, man, you you definitely got it. So I'm I'm super happy for you. I've watched you seed this thing from an idea to to what it is now. I I check on the website once every couple of months. I've seen all the iterations of the website and all the growth that you guys are having. I mean, congratulations. Thanks, really, man. this has been a, a great project for you. Congratulations. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, my pleasure. Okay, so we have schoolofstraditionalskills.com. We have homesteadliving.com. You have a personal site, which I will share on the show notes of this episode. Anybody who is interested to learn more about these websites, about these businesses, to learn more about Daryl, go to copybloggerpod.com. All the show notes will be linked in the episode page. I appreciate everybody for listening. Daryl, very much appreciate your time. Thank you so much for coming on.